So when we talk about social Darwinism, we're talking about a collection of assumptions, some based on data, some based on interpretation, some based, as Whitley pointed out, purely on prejudice. So Wells will go on to say that when we allow women to become educated, we're basically not sure whether they're going to end up insane or not. And that in the end, it's not in the best interest of our species to allow people who are considered degenerate, broken, or weak to propagate. All right, questions make sense. Anything I can clarify before we take a deeper look? Andrew, what do you think about this? Um, well, I just think that these guys are very out of touch with everything that they thought. Uh, what do you think they would say if they looked at modern America? They'd probably think we were out of touch. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but sorry, what do you think about this? Times change. I'm sorry, Andrew, go ahead. I was just going to say times change. So, yeah, they would probably think that we're a little weird, but we probably would think they're weird. So, it's just okay. And times. when you look at the conservative part of American society, do you see any parallels? Uh, uh yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ashari, what do you think? What I think about like women not being able to be like educated. Well, how about just social Darwinism in general? What we've talked about so far. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that the other people are saying. And it was kind of weird just like hearing about like the stuff you were kind of telling us about with the women and everything and we have highlighted so i think it's interesting but yeah i think that's that's all my thoughts okay good anyone else want to add anything okay let's take a closer look So go back to a comment that we made. Um, we said last week, and we've talked about this before, that one of the most powerful influences on the 19th century was Thomas Malthus. And by way of review, he said that there was a relationship between population and land and the production of food. Population increases geometrically. Food in relationship to land arithmetically. That means that population will always outstrip the food supply. So the implication is that at some point in time, there won't be enough food. implied is that a decision will have to be made as to who's going to be allowed to eat and who's not going to be able to. <clears throat> so when you think about this, it becomes a question of who is more valuable 
versus less valuable. <clears throat> and that gives rise to the question of how do we determine who is valuable? Well, the link was really very simple. If you have power and money, by definition, you must be more valuable. Because in their mind, valuable means better able to survive. Am I clear so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. Deeply troubling, mildly troubling. Mild. <laughs> what? Not troubling um, at all? I mean, I guess I've, just with what's going on in the world right now, it's just, you kind of become numb to it after a while and you just sit back and watch everything happen. Mm -hmm. Well, it's easy to get numb. Very easy. So if you go back to one of the early lectures, we talked about a Darwinian triple helix We said at the first level, it's about all humans competing against all other life forms We said the second level of competition is racial. And the third within a given society. So the logic becomes fairly simple. If we become weak, then we're not going to be able to stand up against other races. If we can't stand up against other races, we're not going to be able to stand up against other life forms. And you'll recall this became the basis for the argument by Ross in 1910 for race suicide. Which is that if Northern European whites don't get their collective act together, they will find themselves under the thumb of people of color without a single shot having been fired. Some of the comments that Wells made are true. The more educated someone is, the later they will marry, the fewer the children they will have, that's true. And as we said last week, between 1880 and 1900, this caused a huge furor The second point is that more people are living. We wouldn't call them defective. But in the 19th century, they were considered defective. But there's a difference between a fact and how we choose to interpret the fact. All right, any questions so far? Is this making sense? 
-hmm. Okay. Do you remember what Charles Darwin said was the origin of morality? Anyone remember that? We've talked about that in the past. Does it come from like our animal instinct? It does in a very strange way. Okay. The origin of morality for Charles Darwin is sympathy. Feeling sorry for someone and collectively making a decision to keep them alive. Anybody see a problem with that? Is that a reasonable interpretation? Anybody see a potential implication of that that could be really bad? Wouldn't that be good, wanting to help people? Yes. But can you think of a way in which it would be bad? That's kind of selfish. Okay, go back to the world of Darwin and the world of Spencer and the world of Malthus. Aristotle said in the politics that if a baby is born defective, It was in the greater good of society to let it die. We have less of a problem with Darwin saying this than people in the 19th century. The general reaction was because we're back to Thomas Malthus. Food is a scarce resource. If we spend precious food on someone who's defective, two things are gonna happen. <clears throat> Number one is potentially they will breed. And when they breed, they will have substandard children. Two, substandard children or taking food away from those best deserving survival weakens our species. So while being sympathetic might feel good emotionally, it's a very bad thing for us to do. That was the argument. Okay, this is a really important point. Take a minute, think about it. Is my, am I making sense? Is it clear? Again, I'm not asking you to agree, nor am I asking you to like it. Yes, that's um, true. You still see that a lot, especially in healthcare. Um, 
when a patient's family takes over um, the patient's care um, and you as the healthcare provider know that the patient is not going to get better, you know, they're basically like a vegetable. Like if someone gets into an accident and you know they're not going to be back to their, you know, previous self, but, you know, the patient's family wants you to keep doing CPR because they want them to stay alive, but you already know they're not going to be back to their previous self. So the patient stays alive, but they're a vegetable. So I think that's kind of the concept of this idea right here. Um, why keep them alive if they're not going to um, be there? previous self or if they're not going to live to their full um, capability. You're right. And let's put it even more bluntly. Keeping someone who is defective alive threatens everyone else's survival. So, We need to keep them from reproducing. Remember our, com our conversation last week about eugenics. Keep them from reproducing. So, go back to what we said. By definition, the rich and the educated were not reproducing and they had no idea why. So that fueled the focus on keeping them, the poor and the defective, from reproducing. And Margaret Sanger, one of the founders of Planned Parenthood, was a member of the American Breeders Association. Her goal, in part, was to stop the poor and women of color from reproducing. Again, if you can't get the rich to do it, you better keep the poor from doing it. Any questions so far? No. Okay. So, if you recall last week, two weeks ago actually, we really don't know specifically what Smith meant by the invis an invisible hand. We implied 
that Thomas Malthus, when merged with Adam Smith, ultimately became the support infrastructure for capitalism. That's going to get picked up by Spencer. And social Darwinism is going to assume that inequality is necessary. We have to get the rich and the powerful who are com out competing the rest of us. All the resources they need because they are the future of our people. The rest of us are not. So if you think about the implications of this, we end up in a society which has only two classes, the rich and the powerful who deserve all the resources and the rest of us. Isn't that the point of trickle down economics? The answer is yes. So the further implication So if you want to think about why the Republicans are not in favor of any form of social justice or social welfare, this is your answer. Questions, thoughts, reactions. You're okay with this? You're not in any way bothered. It's so commonplace, you're all right with it. Dahlia, what do you think? I think it's interesting. I personally wouldn't agree. Um, I think it seems like they're taking the role of authority and the role of God in deciding who... Um, manages to live and receive the resources. And it just reminds me, um, when you were talking about the resources, it reminded me of my ec economics class because uh, we were talking about how there's unlimited wants but limited resources. But I don't think it should be up to a specific group to decide who receives the resources. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an excellent point. And this is how they got around that. We find this um, pretty universally supported.
Remember, there are two different types of social Darwinism. This one is the biological. This one is the sociological. They uniformly argue that because humans are the end of evolution, our bodies have stopped mutating and that because of the nature of humans in evolution, the next step is a kind of sociological natural selection. And they're very clear about this. This is not optional. Ward says, if we don't do it, nature is going to rebel. And there'll be war, and there'll be pestilence, there'll be plague, there'll be famine. One way or the other, we're going to be punished by nature if we don't do it. So we need to buck up and do it. And Spencer wasn't far away from that position. So implicit also is the idea that if you look at the natural world, It's cruel and brutal. So if you think about the implications of this, then sympathy is not only counterproductive, it's counter to nature. It's unnatural. We can't do it. So the responsibility then falls to humans to further the evolution of our species. The further implication is that social evolution has to be patterned on natural selection. Natural selection may appear to be arbitrary, but it's not. So the implication becomes How do we engineer society? And now to some extent, we're back to Thomas Malthus. If resources are scarce, then the allocation of resources becomes critically important. Some people live, some people die. Some people eat, some people don't. So if you look at contemporary society and you think about why we don't invest equally in inner city schools, if you think about why we don't have universal health care, why we don't have a universal basic income, Now you know.
because all of those things enable defective people to live longer and have more children. So don't do it. Questions, thoughts, comments. No one's upset. Everybody's comfortable. I think. I think this idea is. Um... Well, like the whole sympathy thing, it makes sense when it gets to a certain point. Like if all of society is dependent upon somebody, then society will just collapse. So I think like if it gets to that point, then sympathy is bad for society. But I think like for the most part, it's really not a bad thing. And I think it actually mm-hmm. could advance the evolution of our species because those people that would otherwise not have opportunity are given opportunity. So I think it could go both ways. And then also just like engineering society and the practice of eugenics is just, I mean, it's, it doesn't make any sense and it's dumb. It's terrible. It's a terrible thing. So it's my thoughts on that. Okay. Well, Could you argue that Planned Parenthood and reproductive freedom are attempts to engineer society by keeping poor women and women of color from reproducing? Um, I don't think it's an attempt to prevent them from reproducing because, I mean, anyone has the right to go to Planned Parenthood and to seek that option. Um, And I'm not going to like, sit here and argue for it or against it i think that the abuse of it and the use of it as a means of like um protective sex is like you know preventative measures i mean it's not a preventative measure so like you know if you if you don't want to have a kid then you should not get an abortion you should try and avoid having to go through that process so Planned Parenthood okay. doesn't just do abortions. They do the whole spectrum from birth control pills to all kinds of things. They, they don't exclusively do abortions. And that's great. And that's great. I think that- and they, I don't know if you've ever seen them like out in Greensboro, but they have, um, there are abortion clinics in Greensboro and there's people that are out there protesting Um, there and they will stop you on the streets and pass out like the literature that they have about why you need to take birth control and um, how it reflects you as like a Christian to do this and how you're doing a good deed for society Um, so yeah (laughs) well go back to the notion of race suicide go back to that passage from Wells that we talked about. We know that there were some driving concerns which were folded into capitalism in the 19th century. One of which we've already talked about. The powerful and the rich are not having enough children. the poor are having large families. This led to a real concern about race suicide. In an industrialized society, we need enough poor people to staff the factory. That's it. So if you can't get the rich and the powerful to have more kids, all you can do is try to control the population of poor. 
It's not until 1832 that Charles Knowlton in the United States publishes a book on birth control, which ends him up in jail for publishing obscenities. But by the end of the 19th century, Margaret Sanger and others are actively engaging in teaching women how not to have children. You can interpret that any way you want, but the reality of the matter was it targeted poor people and women of color. And I'll remind you, from roughly 1910 until 1929, there were human cattle shows at county fairs where best-of-breed white families were given cash prizes to promote their having more children. I'll remind you that Sumner... wanted to shut off city water, city sewage, deny education and deny health care to poor people. It was a waste of resources. They should go to work in the factories and when they die, we'll put them in a mass grave. So if you think about capitalism in the 19th century, the only moral obligation is to continue to empower the rich. Because again, the assumption is that rich equals the rich are better suited for survival. Diverting any profit whatsoever, any form of social welfare, any form of social justice was viewed as contrary to the laws of nature. Weakness. So even though he wouldn't put it this way, when Friedman is talking about the only function of a business is to generate profit, when he argues that the CEO works for the board of directors, let the big dogs eat. If you're a worker, by definition, you are weak and a drain on resources. Think about the implication.
humans are reduced to interchangeable parts. It doesn't matter how inhumane it is. Doesn't matter at all. Think about globalization in these terms. A living wage in Vietnam is not a living wage here. So let's say that the minimum wage in the United States is increased to $15 an hour. I can pay someone in Vietnam and still claim I'm being socially just because the average hourly rate in Vietnam is 50 cents an hour. And I get to pat myself on the back. By the way, all the studies I've read suggest that this is really ultimately very destructive. It creates a kind of spiral that ultimately ends up in the company leaving the country. Um, I've done a number of assignments in Honduras and there are miles of empty factories once owned by American companies because as soon as the living standard begins to increase, countries move to another third world country and repeat the pattern. So go back to a comment we made last week. In 2011, for the first time, the gross domestic product went up. The total number of people employed in the 11 years since the gap has increased. According to MIT, by 2038, 80% of the American population will not earn enough money to survive. but we continue to build factories in third world countries. Pay the people a fair wage based upon what the average is in their world. And meanwhile, our economy is dying. As I mentioned to you last week, the assumption was that every new generation of tech created at least as many jobs as it destroyed. No longer true. No longer true. So when you couple this with globalization, the results are going to be disastrous. But as long as businesses continue to maintain 
following Milton Friedman. That the only moral obligation is generating a profit. That businesses have no social responsibility. I don't see how this is going to stop. You may recall a couple of weeks ago, we said that from 1960 to 1970, there is a huge shift in American economics such that in 1960, one person, one working adult could support a family of five. By 1970, two adults could support four people. And the pressure continues to mount. Over the same period, poor and middle class people have only seen their income go up 12 to 14 percent. The top 10 percent So how has this imp impacted us? If you were to buy a car in 1975, The car loan would be three years. Think about this. Right now, Americans have $1.2 trillion in auto loan debt. And a significant portion of that debt is past due. So what we've done over the past 30 years is that we have financed the future through long-term debt. Long-term debt assumes two things. You will have a job and your income will go up. So if we continue to argue that businesses have no moral responsibility past the generation of a profit, do you see what's going to happen? In case you can't, the answer is the economy is going to collapse. So one of the points that we want to continue to make, if you think about the conversation we had early um, in one of the lectures about Thomas Kuhn, we are effectively prisoners of a paradigm <clears throat> prisoners of a very specific worldview. The assumptions of that worldview are no longer true. Malthus was right. There is a relationship between population and land. Malthus was wrong 
to assume that inevitably population would outstrip land. He was wrong to assume that ultimately population would outstrip our ability to produce food. But we've built a society and an economic system that still assumes that Malthus was right. In and of itself, there is nothing morally wrong with capitalism. But there clearly is something wrong with social Darwinism. And insofar as capitalism continues to assume that Thomas Malthus Spencer, Ross, Sumner, Ward, Keller, we're all right. We're not going to fix the problems that we face. I don't hear a lot of business owners or even politicians for that matter wondering what's going to happen in 20 years time. Every time a universal basic income has been raised, it's dismissed largely on the grounds that it'll make people lazy. Do we have any data that, that supports that assumption? Apply that to the welfare system. Why do we treat people on welfare the way we do? because in some respects, it's a kind of euthanasia. We can't kill them, but we don't want them to reproduce. So we make their lives really hard. But in the end, we as a society pay for that. Before I sum up, can I ask if there are any questions or anything that I can clarify? Whitley, what are you thinking? Um, <laughs> uh, well, okay, so you know my mom is a Native American and the way that she perceives life is um, that you should never go against nature. So, um, like, uh, seeing people destroy uh, land to build houses and condos and stuff that are like cookie cutters. Uh, she views that as like going against nature. Like that's not the way that um, life was intended for us to be um, living on top of each other in cookie cutter houses or driving in these cars. Um, I don't know, just like living in the city is just not a thing that she is about. <laughs> um, and things like IVF, she is, she is not for that. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and then I guess I'm also a pretty big conspiracy theorist, so I could probably have told you that yeah the economy is going to collapse and it's probably going to be within like the next five years <laughs> mm -hmm. well one of the points that we want to make is that when you are brought up in a very specific paradigm it becomes a filter through which you see the world We've all been schooled in a paradigm from the time that we were born. And because of that filter, we are prone to see the world the way the world has been seen before us instead of re-engaging the world. So to go back to what I said, in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with capitalism. But capitalism as envisioned in the 19th century is another matter. I would also like to question one of the fundamental assumptions of our society, which we also pick up 
from the 19th century. And that's this idea that in the end, all actions are ultimately a matter of individual choice. That in the end, what matters most is me, an expression of my autonomy. This goes back to the conversation we had about John Stuart Mill and the principle of harm. The principle of harm said, if I'm not hurting you, if you can't prove that what I'm doing is going to hurt you, leave me alone. Leave me alone. If you think about the implications, an act becomes social. Only when I hurt you. No. No. Potentially, all human actions have social implications, whether intended or not. This is the 21st century. If we're going to make capitalism successful, then we have to question the 19th century assumptions. And at the top of the list is the question of social responsibility. If all I'm thinking about is what Wall Street is going to say at the end of the quarter, did I make projections or not? If all I'm thinking about is what's best for me, then MIT will be right. By 2038, 80% of the American population won't make enough money to survive. Then what? Any last questions before I stop recording and take attendance and send you on your way for tonight? Did you enjoy this? Was it good? It was great. Okay. Yeah. Ashari, what are you thinking? Do you have any last thoughts? Or Dela, Vidalia, or Kayla? Any last thoughts? Whitney, or Whitley rather, feel free to say whatever's on your mind as well. All right, I will stop recording, take attendance, and let you go on your way. <laughs>